Well, it is already March. Can you believe it? Like 2024 is flying by. And I don't know about you, but uh, it's really interesting when you get on Facebook because you, you have these memories that pop up. And uh, some of them you think, oh man, I forgot about that. That was pretty cool. You're like, man, I wish I forgot about that. That was not a good season in my life. Um, uh, but what came up on, on my Facebook timeline this week was on March 3rd, 2012, Coastal had its very first preview service um, as a brand new church here on the island. And I'll show you a picture uh, from the early days. Uh, that was a while ago. Um, we, we started out in a little church building, uh, a small congregation that had uh, basically had come to the end of its normal life. And so we replanted that church there on the east end of the island. And uh, some of you guys are actually OGs. Like you were there at the uh, first part of Coastal. If you were an OG Coastal person, you know, raise your hand. So yeah, give them a round of the applause. So uh, we hadn't run you off yet. So that's an accomplishment. Um, thanks for sticking with us. Um, but God's done some stuff. In the past 12 years, when I look back at all that he's done, I, I'm, I'm so grateful for what God has done in Coastal and through Coastal. And we started Coastal because, man, we want people to know and follow Jesus at the, the heart of who we are. Like, that's, that's why we exist. We want people to know and follow Jesus. And you say, well, there's, there's already churches on the island. Um, aren't they just doing that? And you say, yeah, I mean, there, there are some, some churches that are proclaiming that good news about Jesus. But there's so many people in Galveston um, who don't have any sort of framework um, for understanding what it means to have that sort of relationship with, with Christ. And so we wanted to create a church for people who didn't normally attend church, but also for people who, who are maybe just looking for a church where they could really grow spiritually and really experience what the Bible talked about when it talks about following him. You see, when you think about it, we, we live in a culture in America where uh, people have heard about Christianity. Like, even if you didn't grow up in church, like you, you're not so isolated that you've never heard of this, the name Jesus. Right? You, that you say, oh, man, I've never heard about Jesus. I've never heard about church. Like, what is this church that you speak of? Like, no, people, even if you don't go to church, like, you know people who go to church, right? And you've seen churches. That's different than, like, if we went to uh, a country uh, like Brazil, where there are tribes on the Amazon River in which you would be explaining Christianity to them. And literally, it's the first time that they've ever heard that. Like, it's brand new. So we don't live in that sort of culture, which means that there are literally tens of thousands of people in Galveston today who have heard about Jesus, have heard about Christianity, and yet are making actually a conscious choice not to follow him and not to be involved in a local church. And you have to ask yourself, why? Like, why is that? They know that churches are here. They know that they could go if they wanted to. And maybe some of them at one point in their life did go to church. Or maybe they've had some experiences in church, and yet they've, they've still decided, no, I'd actually rather do something else on Sunday morning. I, I'm not going to spend my time and energy to be involved in a local church. Why, why is that? And I think a big part of that is because people's experience with Christianity has actually let them down. That their encounters with Christians have actually given them a bad taste in their mouth. Where they say, no, actually, if this is what Christians are like, and if this is what it's like to be part of a church, then I actually don't want anything to do with that. You know, when my wife and I first started dating, uh, she had a fairly limited food palette. Uh, it was Tex-Mex and Cajun food uh, with, with maybe some steaks and hamburgers thrown in there, some seafood. Um, but I love Chinese food. And I would say, hey, listen, why don't we go get some Chinese food? And she's like, hey, gross. That's disgusting. And a big part of that was that her only exposure to any sort of Asian food had been like the Chinese buffet type thing. You know, the golden corral of Chinese food, you know. <laughs> and, and she'd been a couple times and did not have a great experience. And so she just assumed that she didn't like Chinese food. Well, one day I said, listen, I, I want to change the way you think about Chinese food. And so we went... It's a really fancy place 
called P.F. Chang's. <laughs> really decided to break the bank on that one, okay? And, and I ordered something called the chicken lettuce wraps. You ever had the chicken lettuce wraps? And, and the server comes to the table, and he actually makes the sauce for you. You know, he says, do you like it a little spicy or just kind of spicy? And so he's putting it together. And I say, okay, why don't you, why don't you try this? And immediately, she came to faith. Like that was, like the light came on in her eyes. And she says, what have I been missing my whole life? You telling me that this has been available to me and I have missed it? And I said, yeah, remember that time we were uh, in California and we wanted to go eat lunch? And I said, hey, I'm going to get Chinese food. And you're like, no, I don't want Chinese food. And so I got Chinese food. Actually, we, I went to Pei Wei, which is like... <laughs> the little sister of P.F. James. So I went to Payway, and you're like, I don't want Payway. Bring me to McDonald's. And she says, I feel so sick to my stomach that I passed up lettuce wraps for chicken nuggets. And, and that's, a, that's a silly example, but, but I, I think that that's actually a, a good picture for us when we think about people who have a perception of what Christianity is that is based on maybe some bad experiences, but they're actually missing out on what true Christianity ought to look like. And the joy and the fulfillment and the purpose that comes when you really start to follow Jesus. And so today we're going to continue our series on the Holy Spirit, and we're going to talk about what does it mean for actually to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That, that's a pretty churchy sounding phrase. Um, but we're going to unpack it today. So if you have a Bible with you, go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, it's in the New Testament of the Bible. If you need to use your uh, table of contents or just look it up on your phone, that's cool. Um, but it's also going to be on the screen. And Ephesians is actually a letter written by a guy named Paul, who was a radically converted missionary. It's a guy who went from persecuting Christians to now uh, telling the world about Jesus, and he would plant churches. And the church in Ephesus that he helped start was actually one of his favorite churches. It was towards the end of his ministry, and he spent a lot of time in Ephesus really raising up the next generation of Christian leaders. And so when he's writing back to this church, it's, it's a church that he has fond affection for. And yet, uh, Ephesians was written to a group of people who were dealing with a very pagan culture uh, around them. And so he's, he's giving them now instruction about how to live this Christian life in a very pagan and worldly culture. Uh, does that sound familiar? <laughs> I think we can, we can probably find some parallels uh, for us today. So Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to start in verse 15. Uh, and I'm just going to read these five verses and we'll, we'll step back from them. He says this, he says, be very careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to the God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this passage teaches us, I think, a couple of really important truths. One is that we should approach life with godly wisdom because the world we live in is inherently evil. Like if we think that somehow we're just going to adopt the world's practices and culture and morality and implement those things into our lives and we're going to experience a thriving Christian life, then we are mistaken, right? So if Christianity is ever going to be true Christianity, it has to look different than the rest of the world. Like if, if what we are, quote unquote, selling as a church, like if the message that we're trying to get across is ultimately the same as what culture tells us, then what's the point of Christianity? Right? Just, just do life. Right? So there has to be something distinctive about it because this world that we live in really is decaying. Like it, is, it is so toxic in so many ways and will lead people down paths that ultimately lead to destruction and pain and sorrow. But then he also mentions this. He says, hey, don't get drunk on wine. Now, some of you are 
reading that and you just go, man, I don't even drink wine, margaritas and beer for me. <laughs> so I'm safe. Um, to be clear, uh, he's talking about all forms of alcohol, not just wine. And, and this is actually, a, a, I think, a good verse in Scripture where it, it clarifies that what God is warning us about is that we would not just partake of any sort of wine. That's not the prohibition here. In fact, Jesus and his disciples had wine. Right? Paul tells Timothy, have a little wine for your stomach. So it's not an overall or overarching prohibition against any sort of alcohol. Instead, he's saying, hey, listen, when you get drunk, you actually start to lose control. And instead of being controlled by that alcohol, why don't you let the Holy Spirit control you? And that's what this idea of being spirit-filled is all about. It's really all about being controlled by God's Holy Spirit that is in every Christian. And we've been talking about this for the last couple of weeks, and uh, I want to give you just a couple of things that I think will be helpful for us as we think about what does it actually mean for us to be filled with the Spirit. So if you're taking notes, I want you to write a couple of things down. One is this. Being filled with the Spirit is not a command for empty Christians to acquire something that they don't already have. And he says, hey, be filled with the Spirit. He's not saying, hey, go and get the Spirit and be filled with it. Romans 8 says this. It says, you, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but you are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. So if you belong to Christ, you have the Spirit of Christ. Like, if you are a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit. There's no such thing as a Christian who doesn't have the Holy Spirit, who's somehow awaiting the Holy Spirit. No, uh, you can't be a Christian without the Holy Spirit. And you cannot follow God if He hasn't first transformed your heart so that you even have a desire to follow God. Like, it is His Spirit at work in you that makes it possible for you to be a Christian. And so being filled with the Spirit is not some sort of secondary salvation. And some of you maybe have had church encounters or maybe you grew up in a religious system in which they talked about being filled with the Spirit as this additional thing. Like, like hey, I'm a Christian. Yeah, sure. But have you been filled with the Spirit? And that needs to be like a second sort of baptism or a second time where you receive a special dose of the Holy Spirit. And I don't think that's what this is talking about at all. Um, Next thing is that being filled with the Spirit does not necessarily mean a person will speak in tongues. And again, a lot of people in that sort of kind of charismatic religious tradition will talk about that. That if, if you really have the Spirit, then you're going to speak in tongues. That it's an automatic sign of your spiritual maturity and that you have had those things happen to you. And so they'll, they'll look at places like Acts chapter 2, which says this. It says, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Let's talk about the day of Pentecost. Now, the problem with that is that in this situation, it's, it's describing what happened. It's not setting a standard for us of saying, hey, this is always what happens when a person is filled with the Spirit. It's just describing what happened to them on that day. And by the way, the experience at Pentecost was not that they were speaking any sort of kind of private prayer language. They were actually speaking known languages as the gospel was being communicated to people literally from all around the ancient world. So what they experienced at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 is very different than what people today in more charismatic background churches experience. That's, it's, it's, it's fundamentally actually different from that. And the Bible is actually full of examples of people who were filled with the Spirit in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, and yet they weren't speaking in tongues. I'll give you a few of those examples. Exodus chapter 35, uh, God gave an Israelite leader craftsmanship skills. He was filled with the Spirit and was able to, to actually build some really cool stuff. Uh, Judges chapter 14, a guy named Samson, really strong guy, defeats a lion with his bare hands because he was filled with God's spirit. Luke chapter 1. Elizabeth, uh, Mary's cousin, prophesies to Mary about Jesus because she was filled with the spirit. Acts chapter 4. Peter and John 
some of the disciples speak boldly before this religious council, the Sanhedrin, says that they were filled with the Spirit. Acts chapter 13, uh, Paul, who wrote this letter of Ephesians, confronts Elymas, the sorcerer. And when he does, it says he was filled with the Spirit. So not everyone who's filled with the Spirit uh, speaks in tongues. And so to be filled with the Spirit does not necessarily mean that that is an automatic indication that you're going to speak in tongues. Uh, I'll just give you one more example biblically of why that's true. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says this. It says, Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. And then he asks this question. He says, Are all apostles? And the answer is no. He says, Are all prophets? And the assumed answer, again, is is no. Are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all have gifts of healing, and do all speak in tongues, do all interpret? Again, the answer is no. He's saying, listen, we all have different gifts. We're going to experience this in different ways. We have different roles in the body of Christ. And so to be filled with the Spirit, if you automatically assume that that means that you're going to somehow speak in tongues, you're missing it. That, That is not it. So what is it? Well, I write this down. Being filled with the Spirit is about power and direction. It's about power and direction. Now, I've used this example multiple times, but um, I'll repeat it. Um, When you think about being filled, some people think about liquid, like that you're literally filling a jar. And so for some people, when you think about the Holy Spirit, it's the idea that, hey, listen, I, I need more of the Holy Spirit uh, and so maybe you, you think like you're running low in your gas tank in your car. Like I need more of that spirit. Running low on it. So I've, I'm down to one gallon, but my tank can hold 20 gallons. So I just need more of that. That's, that's not it. Uh, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. Um, he has a will and a character. And, and so he, either you have the Holy Spirit of God living inside of you or you don't. Uh, Being filled with the Spirit, a better picture of that is to think about a sailboat. Y'all enjoy seeing the Harvest Moon Regatta? Uh, It's it's one of my favorite days. It kind of sneaks up on me. You know, I I don't see it coming, but then all of a sudden you have those days where you're on the seawall and you're like, man, look at all those boats out there. Isn't that cool? And so there's all these sailboats that we get to watch. And the idea is that uh, the wind will push against that sail and when the wind pushes against the sail, what, what do we say happens? That the wind fills the sail, right? So we're filling the sail with that wind, which, by the way, is also a pretty common analogy for the Holy Spirit throughout Scripture, is like this wind of God. And when the wind pushes against that sail, it gives it two things. It gives it power, right? It, it moves it forward. But it's also giving it direction and guidance. And that's the idea for us as followers of Jesus. That we are allowing God's Holy Spirit, who is already in us if we're Christians, to give us power and direction. And that is available to us 24-7. We don't have to be in a church service to experience that. You can experience that at home. You can experience that at work. You can experience that in great moments in your life and really low moments in your life where you feel God's spirit literally empowering you to get through the day. You think, man, there are days where I I need the spirit. (laughs) You know, because if I'm trying to do this on my own, it doesn't work well. And at the very beginning of my message, I said, you know, I think that there are people in our culture who've had encounters with Christians or, or maybe even personal encounters with Christianity and, and felt that it was lacking. And I think a big reason for that is because they've encountered Christians who actually weren't spirit filled. They were saved Christians. They were people who God had forgiven of their sins. They're, they're not going to stand before a holy God without a plea um, because Jesus was their plea, right? He has atoned for their sins on the cross. And yet, their daily experience of Christianity doesn't look that different from the rest of culture because they're not actually relying on the Holy Spirit to be their source of power and to be their direction. 
So to be filled with the Spirit, in one sense, think of it like that sailboat. I love what Dr. Greg Allison has to say about it. He, he wrote a great book uh, about the Holy Spirit. It's a fairly new book, and we actually have it for sale at the Resource uh, Center. So if you have like kind of theological questions about the Holy Spirit, it'd be a great book to pick up. He says this, he said, We need the guidance of the Holy Spirit at all times, even in the most mundane experiences of life. And he is always present with us to provide such everyday direction. You ever get one of those um, kind of holy hunches? Like, have you ever had those moments where you just feel like God's telling you to do something or say something? Uh, the theological term for that is called unction. Y'all say unction. 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 Y'all learned a new word today. It's the unction of the Holy Spirit. It's the prompting of the Holy Spirit. And one of the things that makes Christianity different than I think every other world religion is that we actually believe that the Spirit of God indwells us and gives us power and direction. That we aren't just ascribing to a set of religious and moral principles that we academically and mentally believe are true. But that we actually believe that we are having a real relationship with the God of the universe. And that he knows us, cares about us, and guides us. And we are certainly guided by his word. In fact, that's about 90% of doing the will of God is just doing the things he's already told us to do in his word. But we also believe that because he is living and active, that his spirit interacts with his word as we read it and shows us what it looks like to apply it on a very personal level. So we know we're supposed to love our neighbors. That, that's found very clearly in the Bible. And yet the spirit is the one who shows us how we love our neighbors. It right? gives us very specific guidance on how to do that. Now, a great question, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this later, is how do I know that it really is the unction of the Holy Spirit and not just me? Right? It's not just something that I want to do. And how many of you guys have ever wrestled with that question? Like, hey, is this God or is this me? Did I have a bad burrito last night? Taco Bell. Like, you know, like what, what is going on in me? And, and there's a couple kind of framework for that. One, it's got to line up with God's word. Right? He's never going to lead you to do something that is contradictory to his word. Um, but then also, as we develop in our maturity, we learn to recognize and hear the voice of God in our life. It, comes, it actually kind of comes with practice. And we do it not in isolation. We do it in the context of the church body. In the sense that there are other people in our life who can maybe affirm what God is doing in us. And, and to say, hey, listen, I, I feel like God is leading me to do this. And those people in your life, if they, they know you well enough and they are godly and wise, uh, that they can come alongside you and speak into that. But, but ultimately, we don't want to be the sort of people who have a faith that is just dead. That's this sort of faith that is just reliant completely on an academic perspective, but instead that we follow a God who is, who is living and active and at work in our lives. And he leads us to do certain things. So the fourth thing on there, and this I think helps with that, is that being filled with the Spirit is about saturation and submission. Now, if I thought about it beforehand, I, I could have brought up like a, um, like a sponge and what happens if you take a sponge and you squeeze it and you put it in a bucket of water and then you, you slowly let it out? What happens to the sponge? It gets what? Filled, right? Like you're filling that sponge with, with the water. And, and that's also, I think, kind of the picture here is that we're filled with the Spirit, is that we're allowing the Spirit to literally permeate every aspect of our being. So another way to say that is that it's about saturation and submission. Saturation and submission. And I, I think that that comes from us being in the Word of God. I think it's actually impossible for you and I 
to, to say that we are filled with the Spirit if we're not also dwelling in God's Word. Those things actually have to be combined. And, and the more we're spending time studying and meditating and applying God's Word in our life, you will find that it's much easier to recognize the Spirit's leadership in your life. Uh, here's what Paul says in the book of uh, Ephesians later on in chapter 5. He says, he says this. He says, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. And so he's saying, it's like getting drunk. In the sense that if, if you've gotten drunk, um, you realize you're not in complete control of your emotions. And you're not in complete control of your actions and your thought pattern. It's, it's so impacted. And he's saying that's actually going to be kind of more like what it's like. Now, he's not saying um, to be filled with the Spirit means that you're, you're going to laugh a lot. <laughs> and you're, you're going to be a little, little flirty, you know. Um, and you're going to dance better, you know. Like that's, that's not it. Um, Instead, he's saying, like, allow that to take over. Like, allow that to take over uh, your life. And then the last thing on here, number five, is that being filled with the Spirit is something that we should do daily. It's not a command that's like a past tense thing that you do one time and then it's done. It's something you would continue to do. In fact, uh, the way that that word is written in the Greek, uh, you could actually translate it, continue getting filled with the Spirit. Keep on getting filled with the Spirit. So you're not just doing that one time. You're living that way. Like daily, you're seeking to be under God's guidance and, and power. And you're seeking to be literally saturated in Him. Where He is, he is dominating your thoughts and in controlling everything that you do. He says, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. And it says, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you may not be a, a real musical person. And so the idea of like, hey, listen, does that mean I'm just going to walk up like I'm in high school musical and just like break in the song when I'm singing somebody? Um, no, that, that's not the idea. It's that, that we, we do that here. Right? Like part of, part of singing, part of our corporate worship is that we are reminding ourselves of the gospel. And we are, we are literally singing the gospel to ourselves as we worship the Lord. So that, that is part of it. Um, but also in our interpersonal communications, that, that God's word is so in us that when you squeeze that, that sponge again, what comes out of it? is what you've put in it. Right? Isn't that the nature of a sponge? That, that literally whatever is filling that sponge, when it's under pressure, that's what will, will come out of it. And my theory, and I think it's a good theory, of course, because it's my theory. Um, my theory is that most Christians... In America today, are not being actually filled with the Spirit, that we're just being filled with the world. And maybe there's a little bit of Spirit in there, there's a little bit of Bible in there, but for the most part, we are consuming worldly ideas at a rate that far exceeds any sort of spiritual input into our lives. And because that is true, what will come out of us is mainly worldly. And that has been people's experience in the church. That has been people's experience with Christians. And for some of you, that may be even be your own religious experience. And you say, I, you know, I thought this would be different. Man, what am I doing wrong? And the, the answer is that you haven't really allowed God's Holy Spirit to take control. That's the truth. That at the end of the day, you know that you've asked God to forgive your sins. But allowing God to, to take control of your life has, has been difficult. 
And if that's going to have to happen, guys, you've got to be in his word. That's where it starts. It, it actually doesn't start in a church service. There's not an emotional moment where like, we can create this moment and the music's going to play and it's kind of eerie music in the background and you can come up and I'm going to lay hands on you and then you're going to just be filled with the Spirit and you're just going to be living for God ever, ever since then. Man, that's not the case. Man, it's a daily grind. It's a daily choice that you're going to allow God's Spirit to lead you and guide you and empower you. I love what he says here in Colossians. He says, Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your heart. Again, if you're writing this notes, write this down. If you want to be filled with the Spirit of God, make sure you're prayerfully spending time with the Word of God. And that's it. That's the secret sauce. Like, that's the thing. That if we're not spending time with God, in fact, if the only time that you ever spend thinking about God or having a kind of spiritual moment is Sunday morning, where if, if, even if you come every single week, it's not going to be enough. <laughs> like, it, it'd be the same if you were trying to get healthy and you're trying to lose weight and get stronger. Like, if, if you just go to the gym once, a week, but then sometimes you miss, and so really you're just there like two or three times, maybe in a whole month, and you think that, hey, listen, that, that should be enough, right? Like, I mean, I, I've spent a total of about three hours working out, so surely I, I should be super skinny and ready for bathing suit season, right? You're laughing because you know that's not true, right? That that's just not going to be enough. Guys, why do you think it's different for Christianity? Why do you think that you can just come to church you know, a couple times a month, and then all of a sudden you're just going like, to live like Jesus and be like Jesus. It, it's not enough. It won't do it. And it doesn't matter who's preaching or how good the band is, like, it won't do it. Like, you have to continually choose to be filled with the Spirit. Daily choose to be filled with the Spirit. And that's not a decision you make on Sunday morning. That's a decision you make on Monday morning and Tuesday morning, and Wednesday morning. So, the way I want to end this message is really a challenge for you to do that. And I can't do it for you. And I can't come to your house. I'm not going to wake you up. I'm not going to text message you. Like, you're just going to choose to do this. But we can help you, right? One of our themes for the year is you can do it, we can help. And so we want to help you. And if you say, I don't even know how to read the Bible for myself, like, let us help. Uh, we've got some resources at the resource table today. You can stop by and pick up. Man, those would be great ways to start. There's also tons of free online devotionals. If you go to uh, YouVersion, uh, it's an app that has all sorts of Bible translations, but not only does it have translations, it has Bible reading plans and devotional plans. Listen, man, you start somewhere, right? You start somewhere, and you pick something that works for you, and you come up with a plan. You come up with a plan. You say, this is when I'm going to do it. I'm going to spend time in the mornings. Or, or maybe you're like, hey, I'm going to do it in my lunch break. Or maybe it's a certain time during the day. But you, you find a, a, a game plan for how you're going to make sure that you're allowing God's Holy Spirit to take control in your life. And that starts by, by being in the Word and spending time with Him. So uh, I'll give you some space to do that this morning. If you don't mind, just bow your head and... Um, like I said, it, it, it's not something that I can magically bestow upon you today. I can't like uh, just come up to you and, and say, now you're filled with the Spirit and, and everything's going to change. That, it doesn't work that way. For you to be filled with the Spirit is that choice. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have Him inside of you already. The question is, will He take control? Are you going to submit and surrender to Him? Are you going to allow your, your thoughts to be saturated with his thoughts, with his word? When you're in the car, what kind of music are you listening to? Are you, you thinking about the things of God? Are you worshiping? Are you spending time just being in his presence? For some of you this morning, uh, maybe you just need to have a little bit of time of confession before the Lord where you say, uh, God, there's a gap between 
who I know I'm supposed to be in Christ and the way I'm supposed to live and how I'm currently living. And a big part of that is not what happens on Sunday, but what happens on Monday. And so maybe at one point in your life, you're really faithful and reading God's word and spending time with him, but it's, you've just kind of gotten out of that habit. And this morning is just a reminder to say, if I want to live that sort of spirit-filled life, I have, I have to come to him daily and allow him to fill me up, to be the wind in my sails. And then some of you are in this room and you'd say, you know what, Aaron, I've, I've actually never lived that way. Uh, I, I've maybe had some religious experiences, but, but I've never actually taken my faith home. It's always been a very church-based, event-based, worship service-based, small group or Sunday school-based experience. But outside of that, man, I haven't really spent time with him. And, and for you, maybe today's the moment where you say, you know what? I'm tired of missing out. I'm tired of eating chicken nuggets when there's lettuce wraps offered to me. So much better. Heavenly Father, that's, that's not just the, the prayer that I'm praying as a preacher. That's my prayer too. So God, show us what that looks like. God, give us a hunger for your word and a, a genuine and deep desire be filled by your Holy Spirit. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.